Well, hello there, auto enthusiast friends that are uh, roaming about on this great big planet we call Earth. Yes, it's true. You push the button again. You haven't learned yet. You've hit play <laughs> on yet another... Another licit episode of V8 Radio, Kevin. <laughs> licit. Licit. Right on. As in the I, opposite I, of illicit. I know. Which, which would I rather be, licit or illicit? I don't know. What's going to give us the more uh, listens? I don't know. Licits? <laughs> we can start calling them our, all our right. listeners. Cut. Start over. <laughs> what? All right. Illicit means uh, like like illegal. Like uh, correct. Like forbidden. Yeah. Yeah. Illicit means not forbidden or lawful. All right. So this is wait, this has to be a lawful episode. Yeah. We have to keep it above board today, man. Oh, all right. Well, this is the V8 Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Oste, joined as always by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cuball clark How are we doing today, my man? We're doing good. Doing yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. You look it. You uh, suck doing, uh, <laughs> with your 70 degrees. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, there's a lot going on today. You know, it's uh, it's February. It's, it's Daytona Day today. Daytona oh. 500 is running right now. And uh we got a really nice weather weekend here. So I'm in my garage and I've got the big roll up door open and the, the Buicks in the driveway. And I got a short sleeve shirt on. Look, I'm, I'm squinting because of the sun. You see Stop that? yourself. And it's, it is like 70 degrees here today. Yeah. I'm wearing a, a coat. I'm wearing a stocking cap. So my head doesn't freeze and my garage door is down. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, there you go. Y- you'll get there. I'm just yeah. trying to soak it all up right now. Yeah. As yes, you should. And you know what else takes a soaking? <laughs> <laughs> you, me, and all the listeners, thanks to our V8 Radio trivia contest that we have every episode. <laughs> God. Oh, we're off to a great start. Oh, yeah, gee whiz. It's all, all downhill from here. Yeah, here we go. So we ask a trivia question in the beginning of the episode, uh, usually automotive related. And then, uh, you know, of course, at the end, we reveal the answer. And if you were... If you had the fortitude to stay with us, you'll find out the answer. And boy, will you sleep better if you know. <laughs> See, we're really providing a service here. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Helping you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are your sleep study. <laughs> Please You're welcome. Till, <laughs> Please wait till after the show. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Do That's you have awesome. a trivia question? Uh, I do have a trivia question. But before we get into that, um, I have to offer up a concession uh on Hmm. on one of our trivia questions it seems that uh on our show from december 18th uh 2021 i asked you a question regarding um what aerodynamic technology was available on Mm -hmm. fifth gen z28s and hd silverado trucks and you got you your answer was um something like flush flush mounted glass and of course that wasn't what i was looking for however i got the question wrong so uh, I made it impossible. <laughs> so, <I'm right. laughs> so I made it impossible to answer correctly. So I'm going to have to give you the, the win in that column. I'm going to have to ask our official V8 radio statistician, Yardley, to open up the archives and go back to that 1218 show and mark a win in that column for, for Kevin. Uh-huh. And so the question, the, the correct question was, what aerodynamic technology is shared between 5th Gen Z28 Camaros and 2019 Silverado medium duty trucks. And I know if I asked it correct, if I, if I asked the question correctly, you would have gotten it immediately, but because sure. of the way I asked it, I made it impossible. <laughs> Therefore defaulting you with the, with the wind, my friend. Well, there you go. And the correct answer to that was the, the flow tie, the flow tie. I, I, see, you knew yeah, you yeah, right yeah. away. The, uh, the bow tie thing in the grill that helps mm-hmm. do things that we can't really describe, but it was great. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, hey, I appreciate that. So, congratulations! You're already a winner. That'll make up for the the three in a row from the <laughs> yeah, right the, the, the thing in Pennsylvania. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> all, right, all right. So, well, all right. Go for it. So, good stuff. All right. So, the real question today is, uh, Kevin, you remember when? Um, remember those keys that GM came out with? They had little coated resistor on them for mm. part of the security. Well, when did GM start using that? And for the bonus, what car did they initially use that on? Mm, that's called the pass key, right? I think that's what it that's could called. be. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, it's, and it's identified. You see it on the on the side of the key. It's got that looks like a little thing there. You can't quite put your finger on it. It's got a little black plastic surround. Yeah, it's a little chip, uh, a little yeah. resistor of some sort. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the story that I'm aware of, and I don't know if it's true, is that um, in the in the cities in the United States, Chicago, California, New York, I think Miami, Dallas, um, the Chevrolet Corvette in the 1970s and early 1980s was the most stolen vehicle in the country. Oh, wow. And at one point, uh, there was a, st- a statistic in the city of Chicago that your new Corvette, under certain circumstances, if you left it you know, parked on the street in certain mm-hmm. areas, it had a... You had an ownership lifespan of 24 hours before the thing got stolen. <laughs> gravy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Right. And, you know, I think at that time, that was the, the end of the C3 generation, <clears throat> uh, which came out in 68. And those cars, you know, thieves figured out how to get into them, you know, mm-hmm. by then. And a, and a Corvette, you know, it's a, it's a plastic thing. So it wasn't very hard to, to jimmy one open and steal it. So I think they ju- uh, created the passkey system. Primarily, it was launched in the Corvette to help reduce that theft rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my my recollection is it came out on the eighty four Corvette, the Gen uh, Gen four Corvette C four Corvettes, and it was part of the technology package that they were heralding. Trying to convince people to buy them because, you know, if you bought one and, and it got stolen that day, you know, that wasn't good for sales and it wasn't good for insurance premiums. Right. And also not fun. <laughs> not much fun. <laughs> not, not, you can't see the USA in your Chevrolet if it's stolen. Right. Somebody else can. but you- <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The guy who ripped it off sure can. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. So that is my my story and I'm sticking to it. All I, right. So- I don't so Kevin says 1984, and it was launched uh, for the Corvette. Yeah. Due to high theft. All right. Duly noted, sir. I mean, at least it sounded good, right? It sounded great. It sounded <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> okay. All right, y'all ready for this? Yeah, lay it on us. Okay. Well, today, as we mentioned earlier, is. Uh, Daytona 500 day. Boogity, boogity, boogity. That's right. So let's go. Let's go back in time, um, a whole twenty years. Okay. What was the 2002 Daytona 500 pace car, and why was it significant? Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. All right. All right. This is gonna be good. <laughs> Start your engine. Yeah, man. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, typically every car that paces the Daytona, will ha- and there'll, there'll be a, um, a consumer version that, that can be bought, um, and it has the, the graphics package and all that good stuff on it. In 2002, I'm going to say the pace car was a Grand Prix GTP, Ooh. Mm. I, mean, I mean, oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 and I'm going to say the significance yeah. is mm. it was the first front wheel drive car to pace wow. the Daytona. I mean, interesting. Interesting, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pontiac GTP, the Grand Prix GTP. Yep. And you you had something like that, right? I did. I had a '99 GTP. Man, that was a quick car. Yeah, yeah. Those were those were neat. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, huh, okay. yeah, the supercharged 3.8 liter Buick engine. Yep. Mm. First front driver on the high banked super speedway. I added a little bit at the end there. Yep. <laughs> All right. We were all thinking it. Yeah. That, uh, I suppose, we'll find out. We will find out at the end of the show, Kev. Right on. Well, um, we have a couple other quick things. Uh, You had posted in our 
our shared show notes. We have notes, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, we do show <laughs> prep once in a while. Yeah, every 16th episode, there's <laughs> one one line. <laughs> <laughs> we got to build a whole show around it. <laughs> yeah, in a text that says, hey. Uh, but this time, you, you posted something uh, shared from Mr. Vince Walburn, right? Correct. Yeah, he left us a really, really nice review about, about our show. So uh, thank you, Vince, and I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and read it for us. Uh, great entertainment and always informative on the state of the car culture in the world. Talk of the audio, the auto restoration and repair business, car shows, tools, and life with an old car is always on tap. Wow. A definite feel of, quote, Americana that is hard to find in the podcast world. Mike and Kevin are always great to listen to. Time well spent. That is amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> I love this review. This is am- This is awesome. Thank you, Vince. Yeah, that's about the best one ever. I think, mm-hmm. um, uh, and, and not because he's just he's being kind to us, which we appreciate. But I'll tell you what, it it hadn't really dawned on me until I read this review that I think one of my life's dreams was to create some sort of Americana. Well, there you have it. And according to Mr. Walburn, you know, we did for him. So that's really awesome. Dream achieved. Yeah, right. So very cool. Um, Of course, anybody's welcome to share the reviews. Uh, This one was on the Apple podcast platform. And uh, but that was very nice. So thank you so much. Yes. Thanks again, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, Let's see. I have I have one more interesting comment that um, that was uh, posted today, actually, in a Facebook group. So our last episode, we chatted about the Fire Fe- Firebird Fest. Yes. 2022 coming to the our small town here of Waterloo, Illinois. <clears throat> and uh, the organizer of the Firebird Fest uh, listened to that episode. Oh, great. Which was cool. And he yeah. said, uh, for those who want to listen to Kevin's announcement on his podcast, you can go to the 24-minute mark to hear him talk about Firebird Fest. Of course, you, know, you can't start at the beginning, too, if you like. But. Yeah, <laughs> you're uh, always welcome to. Right. But I get it. Let's get to the point. Yeah. Uh, Kevin is a well-known restoration business and restored many Firebirds <laughs> for folks all over the world, including cars that came to Firebird Fest 21. Uh, Kevin's podcast is well-known, and he is one of the most reputable businesses in our industry and does great work. I think he means our team does because I'm Mr. Mediocre. Uh, Kevin <laughs> also attends many national events and travels the world teaching folks about classic cars, auto mechanics, and restorations. He's a great guy, great resource for all things classic cars, and has a great appreciation for Pontiac Firebirds. Right thanks, on. Thanks for promoting uh, Firebird Fest. So there you go, man. Very cool. Who's the Pontiac guy now? <laughs> That'd be you, man. <laughs> That'd be you. <laughs> Only oh, for this man. episode, I guess. But. <laughs> So, yeah, people have been very nice recently, so thank you. Even though I you know, used to own a Pontiac Firebird, but don't let that sway you, anyone's judgment. Right. You did. <laughs> yeah. You did. Yeah, 77 uh, Formula. Uh, I painted one, a 68. Mm. That that makes all the difference. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Topper, keep going. I, I've worked on a, a large couple of handfuls at our shop. <laughs> <laughs> And I've walked past our crew working on many more. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) All right, all right. Those cars actually have really, um, they've been such a a presence in in our existence, in our business's existence, in my existence. Mm -hmm. And it all started, you know, for you and I, guys guys our age, with with Smoking the Bandit, of course. And, you know, we all know the story, but. They just, they just never seem to go out of style. No, absolutely not. Uh, I remember a few times uh, seeing some uh, photos that you've shared uh, with cars in the shop, and it is like F-body mania in that shop sometimes. Sometimes it is. Yeah. Um, and again, the, the great thing there is uh, when we share a, a build video series on a particular car, other people watch that and go, hey, well, do something to mine, and they right. send, it, send it in. So we, we get them in. In flocks, I guess, of birds, firebirds. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. Uh, the nice thing is every one of them ends up being different. It's not like we're building a right. series of Cookie the same car. car yeah. yeah. So like right now, we've got a supercharged LS car. I think we have a non-supercharged LS car. We have a Pontiac 400 car. We have a 
what started out as an old 403 car that's going to a Pontiac 455 car. Cool. You know, so every possible, you know, yeah. many factory iterations. offered and yeah. other modified platforms. So that's cool. That is cool. Right on. I love seeing the variety. Yeah. Right. E- the variety the of the L- same car. Even the LS cars, you know, it's all yeah. good. Yeah. You do what you can. <laughs> uh, so speaking of... Um, the video series, we, we put out the final chapter in our 57 Thunderbird uh, build oh, series uh, last week, which, of course, you were the opening voice on. Thank you for yes, that. Yes, right. It was your boy helping That's you out. It. Yeah. And uh, gotten a lot of great feedback on that series, too, because that car, also a bird, but a Thunderbird. Correct. Um, that story kind of hit everything. It was, yes, it's a car, and yes, we... We modified it with a, a new chassis and a coyote motor, mm-hmm. and we showed you know how we did all that. But this was a car that uh, had a, a strong significance, not the VIN on this particular car, mm-hmm. but but our customer's dad um, was a big Thunderbird enthusiast, and he mm-hmm. had a whole bunch of them over the years. And uh, he unfortunately passed away, but our customer bought one because she wanted to, you know, keep that memory alive. Yeah. And unfortunately, the one she bought was a bone stock 57, and she drives like modern sports cars and okay. <laughs> did not like it. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, oh, this is not what I expected. Right. Which was kind of a letdown because now she's like, you know, can you imagine? You know, I want to keep this tradition alive, and my dad loved these, and right. you get behind the wheel and go, why did he like this? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and he might have yeah. really enjoyed the way they drove, but if you're not used to that, Right, exactly. The big straight up and down steering wheel and, Uh you know, a carburetor and things that, you know, Uh you just didn't grow up around. So by breathing new life into that car, it now allowed her to go out and use it and stay connected with her dad. And Uh she's driving the wheels off that thing. That's fantastic. It is. It's super cool. Yeah, that's what we all hope for when when these things come out of any shop or any any type of build is completed that you're, you're able to drive the wheels off of it yes and and it does what it's supposed to do and you don't you know you don't have to be a hardcore car enthusiast to enjoy that i mean that's just yeah. not really her angle her angle is really about the the nostalgia and the family connection mm-hmm. um, and it just happens to be through this super cool thing on wheels so and it is super cool yeah it came out really neat i mean yeah I really enjoy driving that one. I bet it handles like crazy. It handles really well. And it, yeah. it's, we've been getting a lot of interesting feedback. Um, so the first two chapters, it's a three chapter video series. You can find it on YouTube or on our, our V8 Speed Shop website. The first two chapters were a little bit of that story and then kind of getting into it and showing, swapping the chassis. But we made sure not to, there's a couple teasers of the car driving, you know, but we didn't yeah. do a full feature till the end, of course. <clears throat> And it stirred up a lot of people that were fully anti this project. Really? Oh, yeah. And it's purists. And they're, they're like, you know, mm. you, you could have fixed the original Y block and it would have drove perfect. And, uh-huh. you know, the, the white walls and the wire wheels are so much better than a, a modern wheel with a bigger tire. And, you know, how dare you put a fuel injected mm-hmm. engine in this thing? And a Coyote engine is, you know, modern plastic junk and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and really got, got, you know, lit up pretty hard. Um, which I expected, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. um, it, it still goes along my philosophy that I don't know why people have to get so angry about something they don't dig. <laughs> 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 I mean, if somebody crashed into you with the car, I could see it. Yeah, I can see you being upset, but right. Yeah. But, you know, you don't have it, but whatever. So the chapter three, when we pull it all together and kind of tell the, the why, um, it's been one of our highest like to zero unlike ratios oh ever, ever so far so well great uh people are really uh they're, they're either getting over it or you know only the ones that like the project stayed mm-hmm. through to the end maybe to watch it maybe um, the people who have nothing good to say aren't saying anything hopefully they're all in tears because of the storyline because <laughs> i, I kind of was <laughs> yeah right uh but one of the interesting comments we got was somebody said hey you know, you put that Coyote engine in there, which is a five liter overhead cam, uh, uh, you know, modern Ford V8. You should have put a Godzilla motor in it. 
which is the new 7.3 liter Ford Whoa. gasoline V8, which it's an interesting engine because Ford, you know, I, I don't really want to say this, but it, it has striking similarities to a, like a big block version of an LS. Really? The design is very similar to a General Motors, you know, Chevrolet LS engine. And I don't think Ford, you know, took a picture of an LS and blew it up to 7.3 liters and uh -huh. said, here it is. I just think that those principles work in what they did. Uh -huh. You know, the, the head design and the, the block and the casting. and the, So they needed to replace the, the Triton V10 in the trucks. Okay. So that's what this engine's for. Uh, shame on me. I call myself an industry guy. I was not familiar with the Godzilla engine. Oh yeah, it's it's uh, it's coming on, and you know, like everything these days, availability I guess is <clears throat> a little tricky. But uh, you'll you'll start to see them, and the, and the cool thing is the the stock, like Ford truck Godzilla makes like three hundred horsepower, right? Mm -hmm. But you put a small amount of boost on one of these things, and there are guys making like sixteen hundred already. <laughs> Holy cow! And they're staying together. Wow! Um, and it's it's not an overhead cam engine. Really? It's a push rod yeah, engine. It's a push rod, yeah. So this guy was like, hey, you could have put one of those in that car because it's not as wide as the Coyote and it would uh -huh. have fit better and you could have made more power. And, right. And um, I thought about it. And, you know, interestingly, when we did our first Coyote swap Thunderbird a few years ago, it was a 55. Uh -huh. And that one had already had an engine swap. It had a 460 in it. And it wasn't finished. And we talked to the customer and found out what he wanted. And he wanted a nimble, you know, performance sports car kind of thing, like what mm -hmm. a Thunderbird's supposed to be. And the 460 was, it was just too big. It was too, too heavy. Uh -huh. um, so it turns out the Godzilla motor is 300 pounds heavier than a Coyote. Really? Yeah. 300 pounds heavier. Yeah. A Coyote is only 446 pounds. Jeez. I mean, it's, it weighs nothing. So that was the first thing because the car is tremendously well balanced with that uh -huh. lightweight yeah. V8 in it. And the next thing is, like I mentioned, a stock Godzilla is like 300 horsepower, but a stock 5.0 like we used was 450, you know, 460. And uh -huh. the stock part of that is important because this customer, again, is an enthusiast by driving only. So she didn't want something that idled crazy or was super loud or had right. a bunch of aftermarket parts on it that couldn't get serviced at her local dealer. And mm -hmm. so we needed something that was like warranted, factory built, put sure. the number on the board. Um, and, and that was all considered when that car was built. Uh, but it got me thinking uh, that Godzilla motor, because it kind of looks like a Windsor, like a regular Ford V8, but mm -hmm. also, again, you know, dimensionally, it's kind of like that. Yeah. Um, but that'd be cool in like a 66 Galaxy or something. Whoa, boy, howdy. <laughs> yeah, it would. And right now, if you if you jump on the Googles, you'll see people doing fox bodied Mustangs with them. Really? And they're just terrors. I mean, they're just insane. I bet. Uh, and and there, a lot of people are taking the race car route, and I... I think because there's such, you know, animosity against the LS crowd of people putting LS engines in those Mustangs and mm -hmm. and and stuff that they wanted something that they, they could bolt in and really clean house with. Um, I haven't seen too many, you know, resto mod '60s muscle cars or earlier with the, the Godzilla motor yet. But mm -hmm. uh, when when somebody wants one, we would love to do it. I think it'd be really cool. When did that engine become available? I think it's a 21, a 20 really? or 21 model year. Yeah, it, but I think because of the, the world being so screwed up, um, it's been kind of flying under the radar. Okay. Uh, on, and in true typical fashion, like all good V8s, they started out as truck engines, you know, because that's where the, the, the mass right. quantity of production is. That's where the, the money is. Yeah. And then the high performance versions weed out. And if this was, if this was Chevrolet, it would have been in a Corvette and then all the trucks and then all the cars. Right. But Ford already has the Coyote and the Mustang. So they didn't. True. They're not building a Godzilla Mustang from. Yeah. They don't need to. From, yeah. Right. So it's a kind of a different rollout. Um, and, and, you know, like the Shelby, 
GT 500s and, and the supercharged. I mean, they, they're unbelievable as they are, you know, mm-hmm. if you, if you added, uh, if you change that engine up I and mean, somebody's going to do it, you know, for sure. But well, yeah, probably. Yeah. I can see, I can see that going into it like a, yeah, a vintage Mustang. That'd be a great fit. Yeah. Yeah, it would It'd probably clear the shock towers and everything. Right. It's not, <clears throat> not much bigger than a Windsor. I yeah. don't think it's as big as a big block Ford motor was like an FE. Okay. Then, yeah, those, that's those a, came in, you know, 67, 68, not Mustangs. So. Yeah, that's a no-brainer. It would probably be, I mean, to, for a high-performance part, would probably be a lot cheaper than, than Coyote parts. From what I understand, it's pretty expensive to hot rod a Coyote engine. Um, it's It depends on what you do. I mean, if you uh, want to put cams in there, you're looking at four, four, four cams. Correct, yeah. So, versus one. <laughs> right yeah. yeah and and there is uh you know there's a lot more support for those at this point sure but again <clears throat> ev- ev- i think every coyote swap we've done we've had to move the brake booster over and sure engineer something because they're so they're so wide yeah so there's makes sense money spent in development to get something to to fit <clears throat> um, but again that lightweight that lightweight yeah. engine is just oh yeah that's an all aluminum engine that coyote yeah. isn't it yeah yeah they're so nice <clears throat> so yeah so that's all cool that is cool man um and then i spent this weekend so last last show we <clears throat> talked a little bit about uh the broken bolt <laughs> yeah i'm ready to hear the conclusion on that <laughs> you know it's funny about that too uh since that episode aired i think i've gotten three texts from people saying hey if you need help getting that bolt out nice <laughs> yeah nice <laughs> that was very cool um so what ended up happening uh it, as soon as we got done recording our episode i went right back to work on it mm-hmm. and i rechucked up my uh, uh reverse pitch left hand thread drill bit um not the special machine tool just a backwards threaded drill bit mm-hmm. and and kind of jammed it in there and it grabbed that end of the bolt and it just spun right out nice so it was halfway hung up like i was talking about around the gasket material and in the the stuff in there but i think a little bit of it was still in the block and and it just went zip and it fell right on the floor i was like here we are here we go onward and upward the strategy worked because um the bolt remnant had a hole drilled right through the middle of it that's beautiful through through the thread so it the, the plan worked. It didn't hurt the threads in the block. Yeah. I threw a new bolt in and bingo. Uh-huh. So I drove the car last weekend and it it, it didn't drive very well. I was a little bit concerned. It uh-huh. was uh it's kind of shaky and you know Really? Yeah, and I I should have known. I mean I stabbed the distributor back in and started it and it ran. It ran okay. well. You know, so I'm like, sure. yeah, you know, good, we're done. I didn't even put a timing light on it or anything. Uh, uh. <laughs> so this this week, yesterday, as a matter of fact, I said, you know what? Let's go back to the basics and we'll do a proper tune-up on this thing. So I threw a new set of, new set of spark plugs in it. Um, I put some NGKs in it this time, which I, I do like those plugs. They're just the base model V-Power cheap uh-huh. ones. But and i reset the timing and i had a vacuum leak on the the distributor vacuum advance so i fixed that um and then i changed the choke opening speed you know move the Mm -hmm. twisted the black thing on the electric choke um and set the idle and i used a tack i used a timing light i used a vacuum gauge i used you know everything and i set the timing to the factory spec which is so funny because who you know, really, who actually looks at the factory specs and says it needs to be at six degrees before mm-hmm. top that center? That's where I'm putting it. You know, yeah. Every everybody's an expert. <laughs> yes, they are. They're like, you gotta you gotta time it with the vacuum gauge, and that's where you, that's what you gotta do, or time it by ear. Or don't listen to the factory spec. Yeah, it's too conservative. Put five right. more degrees in it, or whatever. Right. And um, on the vacuum <laughs> gauge, it it ran great, but it 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 still pinged under throttle it, it detonated oh really it's the centrifugal advance would kick in and it would be too much and uh, it, it too would, much it would too rattle. soon huh okay yeah 
So I said, you know what? No, I'm putting it 100% to stock specs because it's a 37,000 mile engine with a new timing set. So it mm-hmm. should be, you know, back to yes, back to spec. And I even put the original snorkel air cleaner back on. Good for you, man. Right on. Well, I, I don't want any variables. I just, you know, let's zero this thing out. Yes. Uh, it does have that demon carburetor on it, but other mm-hmm. than that, it's, you know, it's pretty much stock. And the uh, electronic ignition. But. Oh my God, does this thing run awesome? I bet. That's awesome. Yes. It, it starts perfectly. It's it, it it wasn't running very smooth, and I, you know, messed with the uh the idle air fuel screws to mm-hmm. smooth smooth the idle out. And uh, you know, because it had a little occasional pop, pop, you know, little kind of miss yeah. uh stumble here and there, because it was lean and fixed that, and it's like glass. It is just That's terrific, it, man. Took it for a drive and um it's the best the cars run since I've had it. And it it's, should be. You know. Yeah, it's cool when you have an older car and you you don't have to do like a series of extra steps uh, to get it to start and run properly. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you do exactly what was meant to be done when the car was new. You stab the accelerator twice, you turn the key, it fires up. It's yeah. not like you have to like, keep the key going, keep the engine cranking. You're pumping, 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 pumping the gas, or you got to get out and throw a, throw a screwdriver in the into the choke well to get it to start, or any of that kind of nonsense. It's yeah. it's as it should be. Well, and this car was kind of going in that direction of having to do those crazy steps, and it turned out that so this car is a factory in tank electric fuel pump, which mm-hmm. is you know unusual. But originally there was this oil pressure switch on the side of the block. And when the engine is running and it's making more than, I think, three or four PSI, a circuit closes and the fuel pump is allowed to run. But if you, for example, get into a crash Mm -hmm. and the engine stops, oil pressure goes to zero and then it turns the fuel pump off so that you don't have the fuel pump spraying an electric pump pumping fuel in a dangerous situation. So the problem with that is over time, you know, you turn and if the car sits for a little while and the fuel drains out of the the carburetor, Mm -hmm. as you're cranking it, it's not making enough fuel or oil pressure right away to turn the pump on. I gotcha. And then when it does, it's got a pump from all the way in the back to all the way up in the front, fill Mm -hmm. the bowl. And if you did your two step throttle already, there was nothing in the carburetor yet. Right. So not only that, when I put the electric choke on it, the choke is timed. So the amount of time it took to get the oil pressure up, get the fuel brought from the back to the front, get the fuel in the bowl, and then spray it into the thing, the choke was already opening. Oh, because it's electric. Because it's electric. And it's a certain amount of time before it it opens up on its Mm -hmm. own. So then it wouldn't start properly, and it would would be real rough and blowing smoke and everything. Yeah. So I backtracked through all this to figure out what was going on. And it turned out that the uh, spark plugs I took out were all gapped at like 45 thou. Okay. Which I think was done. I think the gap opens up a little bit over time on this thing. It seems a little, a bit much. Yeah, but we did the Protronics electronic ignition conversion. Okay, so you got a hotter spark. Hotter spark, right? So a 45 thou gap is like GM, HEI territory. Yeah. You know, like. And I went back to the Petronics instructions, <laughs> and it doesn't say anything about gap. Hmm. So I think at the time, and this is, I don't know, five years ago now, I thought, yeah, it's an electronic ignition with a, a new performance coil. Let's open that gap up a little bit because it's going to be a better flame right. front and all that. Uh, no, it turns out that Petronics says, yeah, if you want to open it up, open it up 500 thousandths. Oh, boy. Just a super tiny bit, which basically yeah. means don't do not do anything. Right. So the stock spec on this is a 30 thousandths plug gap. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So you had, uh, it was open quite a bit more. It was open. 15 thousandths extra. 150% more than it should. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. So I put the, <clears throat> I gapped a new set of NG, NGK plugs, put those in, and then I slowed the, the choke down so that, all that stuff could happen and the choke would still be okay closed and then i jumped out the uh oil pressure switch and put a an electric 
jumper wire so that as soon as you turn the key on, the pump is running. The pump is going to come on. Oh, that's great. And it's, you know, again, anti-safety feature. But uh, like in my Galaxy and the fuel injection cars we do at the shop, we put a, uh, it's actually a Ford part and inertia switch that we put in the trunk. Sure. Yeah. It, it actually has a big ball bearing in it, like a, like a buckshot ball. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And it sits on a contactor, and if the car gets hit, it knocks that ball off, and it turns off the fuel pump. That's uh, the that's the circuit. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put one of those in the car, so it'll still have the have safety the feet, function, the safety feature. Okay. But it won't depend on the engine oil pressure. It'll depend on an impact. Sure, that's yeah. great. So because you have that electric pump, you just have to turn the key. Say you haven't started the car in a month, and the and yep. your flow poles are empty. You just have to turn the key, and it's going to fill those flow poles for you. Right. And so I thought that'd be great. But yeah. again, at the same time, the choke was already coming off. Because even if you just turn the right. key on it, if it's dry, it's going to take 10, 15, 20 seconds. Sure. You know, to get enough fuel in there and then, you know, you pump it and whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I slowed the choke down. And now that's the concept. If it sits for a while, I just turn the key, let it sit for, you know, 10, 15 seconds. Then slowly squeeze the gas pedal a couple times. It'll set that choke valve set in place. Choke, yeah. Uh, and then it, it, it starts in, inst- I mean, it's like half a rotation. Oh, <laughs> doesn't that feel good? <laughs> Just boom. Yeah. 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 It's great. Mm, I love it. Love it. Yeah. And it doesn't leak. So the whole point of that whole project was to fix the front crank seal. Front crank seal. Uh, which is fixed. Doesn't leak. Oh, that's good. Good. Okay, good. Well, that's a good byproduct of all this work you did. <laughs> yeah. The actual original goal was achieved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. For now, anyway. Uh, and that's the, you know, the enemy of these cars is, is a lack of usage and that's when yeah. things dry up and they, they start to leak. So it might leak again, but right now it does not. Um, and then the, Interesting little side byproduct was that putting that stock air cleaner back on. So I had a, an open element, you know, mm-hmm. filter. And, and that had two problems. One we talked about before, it was so flimsy that you tighten the wing nut and it would bind up on the throttle linkage. Right, right. And it, it wouldn't idle down because it would hang up on that. Mm-hmm. So I figured that out. And when I put the stock one back on, of course, it clears everything. Uh, but it's it's so quiet. Mm-hmm. You know? Because it's an enclosed thing. Yeah. And the hot rodders are saying, well, you just choked out, you know, 15 horsepower or whatever because it's breathing through a snorkel now. It's a luxury car, my friend. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. There, yeah. There, there's that. Um, and if I really want to, I might punch a few holes in the bottom of it or something and okay. give it a little breathing room. But I, and maybe it's it's probably because of the, the new timing chain and the, the tune-up I put on it, mm-hmm. it performs better now than it ever has. Oh, that's great. So I, that's I'm not perfect. missing my airflow benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did do a air fuel gauge tune on it last year and set the metering rods and everything. Mm-hmm. So I got to check that to see if I'm, by restricting the airflow, if it's running perhaps a little oh, rich. A little rich, perhaps, yeah. I got um, you. But we'll find out. It Maybe. doesn't feel like it. I mean, it, it just feels great. Mm. Well, you can you can throw uh, an air fuel. Um, you probably throw something in the tailpipe, couldn't you? That's going to measure air fuel. Uh, well, we I have fittings that we welded into the. Oh, you do. Okay, perfect. Yeah, they're, <clears throat> they've got a, a a bolt cap in them now, but uh-huh. you can s- unscrew that and slip in a throw an O2 band. sensor. Oh, yeah, great! Oxygen sensor and measure that. <clears throat> yeah, we try to tune all of a, all the carburetors with that. Yeah, for sure. So you're not you're not guessing. Yeah. That's, you don't want to guess with that, especially if it's something you're going to put a wide open throttle. You definitely don't yeah. want it leaning out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah oh, sure. boy. So, you know how it is when you when you knock out some bigger projects, then the, the smaller stuff comes back into focus. You know, mm-hmm. your, your, your mind goes looking for things. And there were a few other annoyances on this car. Uh, <clears throat> sun visors would slowly droop. I, f- I know that that as, struggle as, as you drive and, and so with the rearview mirror it would slowly droop uh-huh. um so i went through and cinched all those down and um so far they're they're dynamite i i don't know i th- i remember tightening those in the past i don't know if i was just being conservative on it or if they did it truly loosen up mm-hmm. but right now they're like 
they're stuck. They're, they're good. not going anywhere. So that, that's good. Nice. I'm sure the, the first time I grab it and flip it down to block the sun, it's going <laughs> to... <laughs> the screws are going to come loose and that's it. It's fall out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was nice. another little side project that that had me stumped for a while. The car would go dead every once in a while in the garage. The battery would just go to nothing. Oh, I think I remember you talking about that before. Yeah, and I was blaming, you know, cheap batteries and mm-hmm. all this stuff. And it, what I found out is it was the glove box light. Ah. This car has a light. And a, it's a luxury car. It is a luxury car. With uh, an illumination source in the glove box. And mm-hmm. over time, the latch had worn not, oh it loosened it didn't wear it loosened okay so the the it's a pin switch it'll push button yeah. switch on the bulb and the strength of that spring was enough to push the door away enough to turn the light on ah. so it, it appeared closed sure yeah um so okay sure we'll tighten up that latch well that's like nearly impossible is it oh gee whiz <laughs> And to describe the mechanism, so you look at this car, the front of the dash has wood grain trim, mm-hmm. and in that trim is where the twist knob is for the glove box. The door is below that. So the like oh, I think on your okay. car, on your car and most, you know, Camaros and GMs and a lot of, you know, yeah. Mustangs, the latch is in the door itself. Correct. It's a little push button, it pops the door yeah. open, yeah. In this case, it's not. The latch is above in the dash. Oh, this, so this fancy. Trim. Yeah, right. <laughs> so what ends up happening is you've got your twist knob and then the trim. And then there's a <clears throat> like a, a lock nut behind the trim, but in front of the dash steel. So it's captured oh. behind the trim. And then the, the latch mechanism is threaded inside from the back. So in order to fix this, it, and the whole thing loosened up, so we're just kind of wobbling and spinning in the in the dash. Okay. To fix this, you got to take the tumbler out. You got to take the knob out. Oh boy! And and the key slot, and then go inside and remove the latch assembly, and then figure out how to put it back together and tighten it up. And Yikes. There, of course, there's a trick, and Kelly was, you know, Kelly knows the trick on all this stuff, and she was looking at it. And um, at first, I just wanted to get the thing to close again because it was, it was so loose, it was hanging open. Right. And on most of these locks, you you have a, a pinhole on the side. You put a, right. You put a paper clip or something in uh-huh. there, and it it pushes all the little tumbler fingers down so that they can slide out of the hole. Correct. Uh, and this has that same kind of thing. But you got to also work the latch itself, a little spring-loaded grab mm-hmm. latch. Oh, sure. So I'm, I'm under the dash. I find the hole. I push the thing. I grab the little latch, and uh, bing! The, <laughs> the, the, the knob actually ejected out of the car. It, sh- <laughs> it lands on the floor, <laughs> and the latch popped upward and landed on top of the inside of the glove box. <laughs> the, oh, the whole thing, It just disassembled itself. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, and then I could see that little little nut inside the the dash. So I brought the whole thing over to the bench, and I'm assembling and disassembling it on the bench. You know, uh-huh. to get the feel of how this thing works, and yeah. lubed it up, and you know, made it all nice. Put it back in the car, and realized that to tighten the lock nut, you need a very large hex key. Essentially, it's like an Allen wrench. Okay. Because you, it, there is no way. It's an inside surface. It's like a, an Allen, you know, mm-hmm. it's like a cap screw, I guess. Yeah. Um, and you can't get any other kind of tool on it except for that. Uh, so I went, oh, man, that's a weird one. But, of mm. course, I got up and went in my toolbox, and there it is. Hey, uh, how about it? Uh, yeah, I got a couple of nice sets and clicked <laughs> it back together and torqued it down, a little drop of red Loctite, and blammo, the glove box works perfectly again, so. Heck yeah, man. I know. And it's sunny and warm. It's just been a good day. These little projects really are satisfying. They are. Yeah. And even when you got to go back to the book and put aside, you know, what you think you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. (laughs) I know how to do this. Yeah. Let me me show you how to do that. Yeah, I'm I'm usually like that, but, but with 
with this car, I actually enjoy going to the book because I like seeing, learning how the, the factory put things together. Mm-hmm. And just you can see the exploded view, like, oh, they did this and they did that. Okay, that's cool. Well, I can just, you know, grip this and turn that. And Bob's your uncle. I have this apart now. Right. And just learning how they how they engineer things is what really is what really kind of gets me going. Yeah, and and Trevor in our our shop has a, a quote he uses every once in a while. You know, GM had buildings full of engineers mm-hmm. that figured this stuff out along with the service procedure. And when we're building a car like that Thunderbird, taking all these parts and putting them together, you know, we're just you know. 20 technicians on a Tuesday, you know, we're not right. GM <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or Ford or Chrysler with their resources. Yeah. So, you know, as much as, you know, it could be a male trait to not want to look at the instructions and figure mm-hmm. it out on your own. If you got them, you know, you're going to be a lot happier. Mm-hmm. So absolutely read, read the book. Uh, and those are little victories, like you're saying, and little victories are good because that's the gratification of this hobby, if you will, is, you know, Whatever happens to me tomorrow work, I'm not going to. I I won this weekend. (laughs) Yeah, man. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a wiener. (laughs) That's right. So it should be uh, it should be all good. So the goal is to take this car on a little road trip up to uh, Chicago in April. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, good. We'll see uh, you and some friends up there. And that's that ends up being about a thousand mile trip over the whole weekend. And um one of my wheels uh, is bent. Uh. This car had stamped steelies and hubcaps mm-hmm. originally, and I put a set of Buick road wheel, you know, the chrome rally wheel type yeah. things on it. And one of them, the the last time I had the tires balanced, the, the te- it has a little shake to it, and the, the technician's like, yeah, you got a bent, bent, bent wheel, and the tire shop's not going to address that. Um, hmm. But since then, we now have our own tire mounting machine, our own balancing. We do all that in-house. Right. So I'm going to identify which one is the culprit, and there might be more than one, Mm -hmm. and uh, dismount those tires and I'm going to attempt to straighten the wheels. Cool. With a hydraulic, like a port of power and a a fixture. All right. I've I've seen this done before. Uh, (laughs) I saw it on YouTube. (laughs) I'm a YouTube certified mechanic, Uh, sir. I'm a wheelwright on YouTube. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, but I've been to uh, uh, wheel repair places and and Uh watched them straighten the rims. And it's just all a matter of fixturing it up. And then you make kind of a a shoe, if you will, that that is curved, like a brake shoe looking thing. Mm Mm-hmm. And you, you got to push in the right spot and push out. Hopefully, it's bent outward. You know, most yeah. are bent. They're bent inward. I mean, you know, when you hit something. Right. And then you spin it and you keep doing that until it's gone. Um, I mean, it sounds like body work or like framework when you put your frame on a jig. And if you need to straighten it out, you yeah. put chains on certain points and you pull it into shape. That's kind it. of the same concept, right? Yeah. It gets a little hairy if the whole thing's like, like, like it has a wobble. Yeah. You know, yeah, that that's a different story. But if it's just a an impact, you know, flat spot or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other thing too that a lot of tire shops won't take the time to do is you, what you're balancing is your wheel and tire assembly. Mm-hmm. Tires and wheels are balanced totally different on their own, and there are times when you can dismount a tire and spin it to a different place on the wheel. And right. the imbalance in the tire will cancel out the imbalance of the other side of the wheel. Oh. And it might not fix it, but it'll, it'll require less of a weight or... I gotcha. You know, when you're dynamic balancing them to make them less crazy. And the shop that did this just picked up the tires and put them on and said, this is there what you go. got. Yeah, because mm-hmm. who, who, who's going to take the time to do that? Right. You know, unless you tell them, I'll pay your whatever 130 bucks an hour to do that Ugh. yeah and not guarantee any success either but luckily i can do that after hours at the shop and- yeah perfect nice man well i see having a shop pays dividends uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah as i say this having done all this stuff in my home garage right right but the, the tire machine is a good one so 
Yeah, and there's times when you really need that kind of heavy equipment, so it's nice to have it. And, you know, the fun thing is we have a couple of new technicians. We've got a new guy starting tomorrow, as a matter of fact, oh, uh, a cool. mechanic. So I'm using this. My plan is to use this uh, tire mount and balance and wheel balance project as an educational seminar for okay. whoever needs the training on the machine or a, a brush up, uh, which which is me. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully Trevor will take a few minutes and give me, give me some pointers <laughs> on Be, it and, beforehand and have a train the trainer session. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, and I, I hope I, I hope I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Same. Oh man. Well, that's good. I'm glad uh, things are moving along with this, and uh, yeah, it'll be nice to see that that Buick again this April. Yeah, it will be. Hopefully. Everything continues to go smoothly, and uh, you know the the shop has. It's funny because I'm tinkering with this stuff, and we've got all these, you know, big projects going on at the shop, mm-hmm. uh, which is awesome too. And it's neat to see the contrast, you know, between me talking about a, setting a plug gap, and and in the shop we're putting chassis on cars, and yeah, you know, total driveline swaps, and. Mm-hmm. We're just wrapping up uh, this '69 or '72 Corvette Roadster LS3 six-speed wheel brake suspension upgrade for a customer in Belgium. Oh wow, cool! Yeah, and he's actually coming to the states to <clears throat> drive it uh, next month. Oh, nice! Gonna, gonna be cool. Yeah, is it gonna be done? Yeah, we dynoed it the other day. Oh, good. Uh, chassis dynoed it, and it made. Uh, I think it put four. Right about 440 to the wheels. Ooh, nice. Yeah. That'll be a, a nice hauler. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It drives wonderfully. I, I took it for a spin before the interior was even in it, and uh, it was nice then. So now our interior shop did a bunch of stuff, skinned the console, and and did some custom things and made a few fixes here and there. And it's, it's mm-hmm. a nice car. So that's cool. I love those um, early C3 vets from 68 to 72 would be my favorite. Um, with it still had the chrome bumpers on the front and back. Yeah. It yeah. makes all the difference. It does. It makes all the difference. Yeah. The 73 just had the, had the urethane front and the chrome rear. And then after that, it was all urethane, I believe. Yeah. 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 And a couple different styles of that. And then the rear, you know, hatch looking window eventually by 78. Right. Right. Yes. The big, the Something big like glass. that. Yeah. Um, although I recently saw one of those that, I was never a big fan of like the 78, 9, 80 cars. The disco vets. Yeah, right. Sort but there was of, yeah. a pace car and, you know, yeah. uh, a couple things like that. But somebody did one where the entire greenhouse, you know, the from the windshield A pillar all the way to that back glass was completely blacked out. Ooh. So the rear was tinted, the side glass was tinted, the top was painted, mm-hmm. and then the rest was red, everything down. And it was lowered on a on a set of forge lines, and it just it was like a very pure form of that shape. Yeah, and it had the you know the in the urethane or the enduro or the plastic yeah. whatever the the bumpers were, and they worked on that car. It contributed to that. Oh, that cool! Design. Instead okay. of looking like you know playing the federal rule of crash bumpers like they really were, <laughs> but uh, that looked great. And I thought you know if more people saw that, those cars. Those late seventies, early eighties ones yeah. would become a lot more popular. Yeah, well, they probably will just through attrition of other cars, but but still, yeah, it sounds like they can you can really do some good stuff with them. Well, you could go buy a sixty-eight, mm-hmm. and then buy a seventy-eight for a tenth of the price. Yeah, yes, and for all intents and purposes, it's the same car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it kind of is, but, uh, but yeah, that's not. amazing uh, how the how the how that shakes out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the interior is different and of course the drive line or whatever, but if you oh. want, you know, an, a, a cheap fun LS swap project, I mean, that's, that's a good way to do it. You could make a Bon a Bonneville car out of it. Yeah. We had talked about that before, yeah. but that one's gone. We said okay. It. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. No, no use beating a dead horse then. Right. There's other dead horses to beat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 
Yeah. Oh uh, man. So you uh, you got a hat and a coat on. You're still. What'd you say? Yeah. Low forties up there. Yeah, low forties. So GTO is not coming out today or tomorrow. No, sir. It is not. It is not. I still. I still need to get that over to Randy, so we still got to pull the engine back out. But he's been he's been really busy with other projects. Right, right. So, uh, one more interesting thing that I did this weekend that uh, I'll share. Our our buddy Grady uh, owns an ozone machine. Yeah. Okay. Right. A little yeah. box that deodorizes houses and stuff. Uh-huh. And I ran that in the car for about ten minutes. In the Riviera. In, in the Riv. Yeah. Uh-huh. Rolled up all the windows and 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 don't get me wrong, I love old car smell. Yeah, but this one, there was some animal remnant excrement oh, really? smells here okay. and there, you know, and especially kind of in the heater box. <clears throat> I got to take all that stuff out and and you know scrub it. But uh, uh, I ran the ozone machine for like ten minutes and then and then rolled the windows down and opened the doors because the ozone smell it's almost like chlorine. I mean, yeah, it's like a, it's like a heavy duty bad smell. Wind blows through it and gone. There is not a smell in the car. Oh, really? It's incredible. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So those who, you know, you get to the point where the car is, you know, doing well and somebody gets in it, you know, if your significant other gets in the car and says, you know, or the kids, <laughs> you know, what's that smell? <laughs> that an ozone shot will fix that. And I don't know for how long, but it definitely for a while, I guess. Yeah, so, well, I think it, I mean, theoretically, it could do it forever because ozone kills the bacteria that, that makes your smells. Yeah. So so as long as nothing new is introduced, it should stay smelling nice. Yeah, yeah. And I know a lot of local uh, uh, repair shops do that service. Mm-hmm. And it, it came out of the COVID thing. You know, people were, oh, right. uh, were trying to find services to sterilize cars for customers. Mm-hmm. And everybody was hot and heavy to go out and buy an ozone machine. Yeah, and then that kind of died out. But you know, it, I, I recommend that if you got something that you've scrubbed or whatever, and it, it ain't working, see if one of your local repair shops has one of those machines, and uh, have them go to town on it. it cool, it, it works. Yeah, I think some detail shops use that to get like musty smells out. Yeah, things like that too. For yeah, sure. yeah, it works. Yeah. Good stuff. Good yeah, stuff. all kinds of little tips this time. Nice. It's a nice tip episode of v8 radio it's like a show about cars <laughs> how about that that's crazy <laughs> you're crazy <laughs> yeah, well, we turned the corner here. uh and speaking of all that i know there's a lot of interest i can tell in our mm. trivia questions yes yeah the interest is is mounting okay uh let's let's do this let's let the cat out of the bag here so kevin i asked you when gm started using that coded resistor keys and for the bonus I asked you what car they started on, and you talked about how Corvettes had the highest theft rate in the world and a, a shelf life of 24 hours if they kind of parked them in the city. Uh, and you are correct. It did come out for the Corvette, uh, but the year was just a little off. It, it was 86. Uh, came out in the 86 Corvette. Uh, yes, sir. That, that's That was my second guess. Yeah. But close. Uh, I mean, you were right there. I mean, you 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 zoomed in exactly on why it, it happened and and uh, what what they started on. So good for you. So I can still go out and steal an eighty five. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> all day long, all day long, <laughs> without any problem. Well, and I think interestingly, what happened is even the earlier car theft went down because thieves, you know, thieves aren't the brightest people in the world. They're they're crafty, but yeah. all of a sudden, the new Corvettes nobody could steal them. So the whole Corvette got ignored all of a sudden. Oh, I see. It started the going after the word on the cars. street was like, "Oh, you can't steal those Corvettes." So all of them benefited from that. Okay, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Uh, okay, well, your trivia question was, uh, "What was the 2002 Daytona 500 pace car, and why was it significant?" Mm-hmm. And your answer was a damn good one. It was the <sighs> 2002 Pontiac Grand Prix GTP because it was perhaps the first front driver in the Daytona as a pace car, which makes 100% sense. Unfortunately, it's not correct. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> uh, the correct answer is the 2002 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. 
Oh, man. And it was significant because it was the last one. Last train. Ah. Yeah. Nice. And if you remember, it was uh, yellow with a black top greenhouse um, tinted with, uh, I think, a black 17-inch wheel and an LS. And it was nice. Uh, an interesting car. And, and I, I was reflecting earlier today because, you know, of course, Daytona's on. And I, I was fortunate enough back in 2002, I got flown to Daytona by GM to interview Tony Stewart and Jay Leno about that car. No kidding. Yeah, and that's where I met Leno, I think. And uh, it was kind of funny because they they brought a handful of the TV shows and I was doing Hot Rod. And of course, back then, there was only a handful of TV shows anyway. Right. Is, you know, pre-big time internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you got Motor Trend and you got uh, Motor Week. Remember Motor Week? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love oh, Motor Week. Yeah, it's a good show. Those guys were there, and then Car and Driver had a thing there, and uh, you know a lot of the driving gloves books, and then and then us, mm. and I could tell by talking to the other producers that, you know, they're they're gonna, this is like a press junket for a movie. It's gonna be the same questions over and over again. You know, sure. Tell me, it, it was Tony Stewart's. It was Jay Leno's first time in a pace car, okay. so th that was a big question, you know, and and he had his, you know, yeah, well, you know, it's just like you know whatever, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do the same thing as everybody else. Right. So at, at the last minute, I'm like, what, what can I do different? You know? Yeah. So instead of, we ended up doing a kind of a feature on the car without those two guys. We did a, okay. I remember half of the TV episode was on the Trans Am and history of the Trans Am and, and then this car. And I think I had one of those as a press car for about a week in LA. It was, I, it was cool. It was a great car. Love nice. It. Um, but the interview was, Hey, Tony Stewart's a NASCAR driver, but can he do stand-up comedy? So, Jay, let's have Tony do stand-up. And then, Tony, let's put Jay on the super speedway and see if he can drive. Nice. And, and it was pretty funny. So, I had to write jokes for, <laughs> for Tony Stewart, <laughs> like, right now. You know, so I'm scribbling this stuff out. Boy, it and just flew in, and boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I remember. I only remember one and in, uh, in specific. And I said, okay, Tony, here's the deal. We're going to... The camera's going to start rolling, and I'm just going to hold this thing up, and I just want you to read it from where you're sitting, right? And he's like, well, I can't, I can't really even see that. I'm like, well, it's even better. You know, it really has to <laughs> appear horrible. So, you know, okay, camera rolls, ready, three, two, one, go. I hold the paper up, and Tony squints at the paper, and he goes, what's the difference between driving on the 405 freeway and racing at Daytona? Uh, it's okay to trade paint at Daytona. And he's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and then we cut to Leno. Yeah, boy, it's terrible. You, know? <laughs> you can't tell it. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it actually came out to be a pretty funny segment. And uh, Jay remembered it. And Tony Stewart remembered it. Every time I see him, uh, we chat about that. So nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. cool. That's very cool, man. But that was about that car. Mm. 20 years ago, for crying out loud. So Heavens like to Betsy. That's crazy. New Firebird and Trans Am consumers have been sans Trans Am for 20 years. That's now. that's criminal. Yeah. That's too bad. That really is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well, well that is it. what it is. Yeah. So, not to end on a low note, but it was a great <laughs> car. How about that? Hey, how about that? You can still buy them. Go get one. Yeah. And uh, here's one more interesting bit of news. There's a uh, a podcast uh, a measuring source called Listen Notes. Okay. And they've logged so far that there's 2.78 million podcasts out there at this Holy point. Holy cats. V8 Radio ranks in the top 3%. What? For sure. Yeah, yeah, according to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, they are the authority. Apparently, they're on, on the internet. <laughs> nice. It's got to be true. <laughs> So, you know, there's your gratification for listening. You've uh, you, you tuned into one of the top 3% of podcast mm. programs on the entire planet. So Love it. Not a waste of time. No. <laughs> we are important. We're influencers. Right. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and on that note... Uh, <laughs> 
I think I got to get in the house and influence some dishes and laundry at this point. <laughs> yeah, right. Same here, man. <laughs> That's right. Influence some dinner. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, as always, we appreciate you tuning in. And, uh, you know, like we said before, if you if you have thoughts, share them. Give us a review. Subscribe on the iTunes. Um, that seems to be working. Uh, we got a little bump this past yep. time, so that was fun. Yep. I appreciate that. Uh, and that's about all I got. Unless you got any other stories? No, man, I'm I'm good to go. Right on. Me too. So for Mister Cuball Clark, uh, I'm Kevin Osti, reminding you to uh, let's see. What do we want to say this time? Uh, keep set. Keep setting the pace. Nice. We'll see you next time on BA Radio.